The Tasting, Craig Herbertson. The water of life, honey dew that drips gold from the glass like nectar from the bowl of an ancient god. The amber glow of sweet translucent waves cascading in the trapezian cavern of the mouth, each trembling moment a cacophony of impressions, the overture to a composition that will play in your innards and explode into majestic life in the amphitheatre of your head, drawing you ever closer to, but never reaching the unspoken symphony of eternal verity. Gentlemen, I give you whiskey, good scotch whiskey. Campbell raised his glass. Slangebar! There was a moment's silence. The American tourists, millionaires to a man, had barely understood a word of the preceding hour and none of the closing speech. But their palates and their heads had been impressed by the smooth Scotch dialect and the smoother Scotch whisky. Each dram of several priceless bottles had been down to the last drop. A litter of lesser bottles and tumblers, half full or untouched, decked the tables like flotsam and jetsam from a shipwreck. As in the ensuing moment, Campbell, the whisky taster, smiled and drained his glass, and the barriers of decorum broke and gave way to a spatter of applause that sounded from the comfort of the Balmoral room like dry sticks cracking. Bannerman downed his Lefroy. Right, let's get rid of these lightweights and we can enjoy a serious drink. He rose from our table with a curt nod to the company. The big man strode across the room, launched a quick douche day slanted to the whisky taster, and began to harass the bemused guests. Bannerman's restaurant was a legend in the Highlands. Bannerman, owner of the caboodle, was a chef who made his name across Europe as the inspirational maestro of several select restaurants. His name had been good, his food legendary, but that elusive beast, money, only finally fell into his lap with a shrewd bet on the Musselboro races, an insider tip on the unholy risk of a three-way tote had gained him the several millions a man requires to make his life complete. Some might have thought of instant retirement and a life of aimless leisure. Bannerman had simply refurbished his golf clubs, his boat and his fishing tackle. He then closed up all his restaurants and bought a Highland Hotel northeast of Port William. Thousands of customers across the length of Europe were left with a hole in their culinary life, and Bannerman was left to carry on the things he had always done cultivating his own small wine, tending his simple allotment, cooking excellent food, and drinking the same inordinate amounts of Lefroy. The only difference in his lifestyle was that he now cooked whenever he liked and invited only those guests with whom he cared to spend an evening. On this occasion, he seemed to have approached two whiskey tasters from the town, or perhaps they had simply turned up unannounced. Not an unusual scenario, as one could always pop into Bannerman's. The local villagers would often drop in for a pint. We're all Jock Tamerson's bairns, Bannerman was wont to say, and he had no snobbery, rather preferring the simple wisdom and dark humour of the local Scots to the foreign guests. He took every man for what he was. Indeed, on many occasions, a rich and influential guest would find himself turfed out into the rain with a curse. Equally frequently, an impoverished crofter who had dropped in on the way to Glasgow might discover that his joke about sheep had gained him a full dinner and an endless train of expensive whisky, as the chef fended off his money with a stick a couple of bob in the charity box. It was a rare privilege for me to dine at Barrowman's. The place was a well-kept secret, a secret that Mulholland had neatly discovered some years before through Campbell, the whisky taster, an old climbing companion. Me, I was one of Jock Tamson's baners, somewhat down at heel, penniless and in need of a feed. So it was with a sense of baffled awe and unashamed gratitude that I watched Bannerman handle the rich Americans like a farmer shifting cows, smug in the knowledge that I had been invited by the big man himself to stop over in comfort at the Grand Hotel. While Holland and I had come up on the train with the whiskey taster Campbell, a dignified man of around fifty clad in kilt and velvet montrose, Campbell was now parrying requests and small talk like a doctor's receptionist. Finally, he shook off the last of his admirers, a fat New Yorker, whose clothes would look excessive on a Woodstock poster, and spoke a quiet word with his fellow taster. After an interval, where he checked the old odd bottle and exchanged a quiet joke with Bannerman, he strolled over to the bay window that overlooked Loch Creek. Mulholland and I joined him. It was a magnificent view. A sheer drop of some 200 feet, 
shaded by an erratic line of scotch pine revealing the dark, silent waters of Loch Craig, which spread before us like the blood of a dying oceanic hero. Far across the loch, one could see the mare's tails of the Twin Craig Falls, known well only to experienced mountaineers, hardened men who had tired of the runs on Glencoe, the more difficult Munros and the subtle intricacies of the Cairngorm range, men who kept the mountain secrets close to their heart and out of the guidebooks. The falls glittered in the fading light, two ribbon tails of shimmering water that shone like the tracks of tears on a roughened cheek. The three of us gazed out across the loch towards the glistening crags, each to our own thoughts. I couldn't speak for the others, but mine, warm by the comfort of whisky, were of the men who had tried and failed this grim buttress of the Craig Mountains. The crags themselves, diminished by distance, still bore the excessive grandeur of the highlands, eerie, almost contemplative, peaked with late snow. I knew that they were a dangerous climb in winter. Mulholland and Campbell had done it in the 1980s, and Crowley also once long ago in his colourful youth. But several deaths had tended to dampen enthusiasm, an unusual occurrence among mountaineers whose normal response to the violent dismissal of one of their number is a devil making a nonchalance to the manner of their death and a questionable desire to imitate the circumstances. There was talk of a curse, the climb hadn't been attempted in any season for more than ten years, the last summer mountaineer being dragged out of the Great Burn when the snow thawed in the spring of the millennium. The rescue team said his corpse was still holding the rock that had broken in his hand. Campbell, who had been on that rescue team, seemed entranced by the view. He nursed his glass with the wistful, far-off look of a man recalling his past. Sometimes, he said after a moment, in the gloaming hour, I think I can see Glencoe through the waters of the Falls of Craig. Impossible, of course, with the mountain range in between, but still, I seem to see it. Wouldn't be terribly welcome there anyway, said Mulholland with an irreverent grin. Campbell smiled sourly. Best join the ladies, he said with a curt nod. He turned his back on the view, and us, and walked stiffly over to the table. Mulholland frowned. Not like Campbell, he said and then cryptically after a space, must be the anniversary. While Holland drew out a cigarillo, his single good eye surveyed the grandeur below and beyond. Like myself, he appeared shy of company for the moment, content to immerse himself in that hour of twilight, known in Scotland as the gloaming. It was a time of contemplation, the grey space between light and dark, a time when ghosts flitted the landscape, and memories and reveries became almost tangible. It seemed a shame to break the mood, but my curiosity had been piqued. After a space, I said, <coughs> Anniversary? Did you mean the anniversary of the massacre of Glencoe? I refer to that ancient feud, long as estranging the clans. Mulholland had certainly implied it in his failed attempt at tumour. I continued, I know the MacDonalds and the Campbells have been stealing sheep from each other since they first discovered that sheep were edible, but surely that old nonsense wouldn't trouble him nowadays. While Holland smiled, Well, the MacDonalds are all mad, and the Campbells, well, they're just Campbells. But no, I, I'm referring to the anniversary of the disappearance of Jeannie Brown, Campbell's fiancée. I forgot about it. While Holland drew on the cigarillo and gave a penetrating stare out to the Great Falls. Must apologise to Campbell Im immediately. But, despite his words, Mulholland seemed reluctant to move from the window. In the unfathomable waters of Loch Craig, drowned stars began to glitter like scattered confetti on new black tarmac. The shiny, tiny, shimmering points of light disturbed levels of the unconscious mind, and in some sub-ethereal manner almost implored the imagination, as though the clammy hands of submerged sirens reached outwards from the depths of the loch, as though these subterranean creatures might draw you downwards towards a very cold oblivion. For a moment, charged with the inner light of the pearl moon, the strange afterglow of the highlands lingered in the air, glinting ephemerally on the now indiscernible falls of Craig. Then a dark pall descended like the sweep of a cloak, and the gloaming became suddenly night. Mulholland put a cigarette out in the ash tree and shivered. Farantiro's here he said, tersely. How do you know, I replied. I can smell the bastard, said Mulholland through his teeth. 
Bannerman's German wife had joined the throng behind us, and I could see that the Laird of Macvernus and his mistress had filched a few bottles of single malt from the Americans' tables. Two eminent Italian occultists were inspecting the Jacobean portraits on the wall with a magnifying glass. So Delaney, the infamous ornithologist, was insisting that the bottles they shared among the musicians who were waiting for the Americans to leave before they debauched their fiddles and accordions. The rival whiskey taster, a man of ages with Campbell, had escorted one of the young English waitresses to the floor and was demonstrating an extempore version of the sword dance with some of Bannerman's silverware. In short, the crack was on. I saw immediately that Mulholland had been correct. The last of the Americans had just departed and standing next to Bannerman by the door was the infamous and incredibly rich chef, Valentino, who for a reason never explained provoked an uneasy antagonism in Mulholland. Valentino, a man of medium height and dwarfed by Bannerman, was asking some intense questions. Doubtless, it was about food. Both were epicures and perfectionists, both rich and influential. Although Farentino's incredible wealth made Bannerman look like a pauper, there was an obvious mutual respect between the men. Bannerman was the type who only came alive when a guest could truly appreciate the quality of his cuisine, and Farentino was, of all men on earth, the one who could appreciate it most. After some minutes, Bannerman left the kitchen, and Valentino came over to us. He shook both our hands in a formal fashion. The fiddler began to play farewell to whiskey, and together we joined the party. Valentino took a seat with his back to the log fire, somewhat in the shade of the stag's head that rose splendidly over the great fireplace mantel, and somewhat apart from the others. His eyes, partially in shadow, studied the antics of the late guests with an ambiguous expression. There was something about Farentino that lent an aura of inapproachability. Occasionally he glanced upwards, lizard-like in the light, to view the great painting of the Highland Charge at Culloden on the far wall, or stare with a peculiar intensity at the younger waitresses. He would look sometimes with a somewhat supercilious smile at Campbell, which was more than enigmatic. Mulholland and I pulled up beside the two whisky tasters. I warmed my hands in the glow of the flames of the oak fire as Mulholland made his apologies. I forgot the anniversary, he said simply. Campbell looked gravely at his glass. Well, sorry, my fault. I, I can't expect everyone to share that burden. I was unpardonably good. Not everyone, said the other whiskey taster, but certainly me. Uh, again, I must apologize, said Campbell. This is my closest friend, Jamie MacDonald. We, we go back a long way. MacDonald had clearly given off teaching a sword dance to the waitress. He looked breathless after his exertions, but nevertheless seemed an exceptionally fit man for his age, with bright clear blue eyes and red hair. He was large, almost a colossus, broad-shouldered with a slight florid impression to his skin, probably unavoidable given his occupation, and a rakish twist to his full lips. Aye, he said in that melodious West Coast lilt, it's unusual for Campbell and MacDonald to be the best of friends, but as the man says, we are that, ever since that night. I was about to make some pleasantry about the clan feud, mostly to avoid discussing the subject of this enigmatic anniversary, which seemed to hover in an undercurrent behind the conversation. Fortunately, the accordions took the moment to explode into a rendition of Lady Whiskey. Half of the company, now swollen by a couple of crofters, and the travelling salesman began to ring out the chorus. Laird Malcolm, endorsing the people's choice, raised himself precariously to the table and let his baritone ring above the crowd. Whiskey, whiskey, I love ye so well. Promise me heaven, we a wee kiss and tell. You'll I be the lady in good company. My lady, whiskey, whiskey and me. It looked like it was going to be a long evening. We must have consumed half a bottle of a frog each by the time Bannerman brought in his special supper. Apparently you could never rely on its appearance. Sometimes he slipped off to bed, sometimes he might simply enjoy a drink. But it was clear that with Valentino in the company, Bannerman wanted to try something a bit different. With the true genius of the great cook, different did not mean lavish. Bannerman bore in his own hands a large silver platter spilling over with fresh salads, wild rice, and fruit, the centrepiece of which was a single rabbit discernible as such by one 
hind leg projecting from the carcass. The waitresses had already removed a reluctant Lear Malcolm from the table. They rushed to clear a space amidst the whiskey tumblers and lay small plates and cutlery. Some tarries built beige, those Maltese noodles, chutney butter and hops were also laid out as side dishes. A bottle of Chianti was opened, and as always, Bannerman gave his toast to the ladies. For some reason, at that moment, I caught the eyes of Campbell. He seemed to hear nothing, see nothing, as he stared into the burning embers of the logs behind me. This was almost a physical statement, his absence of participation. Then he recovered his poise and automatically raised his glass. With the toast to the ladies over, we tucked in. The rabbit was superb. The company was silenced for several minutes. The light clatter of cutlery, the clink of glasses, the wind sowing in the branches. Then the travelling salesman, who had suddenly recognised Farantino's face from the newspapers, suddenly said, What do you think of the food? Bannerman, always unpredictable, laughed, but inevitably eyes turned to the renowned chef. Barantino's head slowly projected from the chaise like a turtle from a shell. His disingenuous face carried a slight smile that seemed to shimmer and change in the deceptive light of the fire. As always, when he spoke, it was with a compelling urgency that none could mistake. Bannerman's cuisine is quite brilliant, of course, Bannerman laughed lightly. I can boil an egg. It was a delightful rabbit, your own mustard sauce, parsley grown in your garden, Picanti a perfect accompaniment, all delightfully cooked, a delicate touch. But what would you cook then? You're the genius, the salesman had drunk beyond his depth. A few sharp looks fired in his direction. Valentino simply directed it to Bannerman. What is the ultimate recipe? Bannerman paused, the low flames of the fire caught the angles of his cheek, and for a second seemed to transform the congenial face to a death mask. Human, of course, he said lightly. It's like hunting. The greatest hunt is human game because of its intelligence, its ability to thwart the hunter, and not least of all the taboo of its killing. The greatest dish would be man. The English waitresses and a few of the guests made a big show of emotion, but the mistress of Lord MacFairness, a classical beauty of French stock, said with conviction, You are right, of course. It's reminiscent of ancient cult of the Fisher King. Human sacrifice may be abhorrent but it had its place in the growth of human awareness. Whoever eats a human must surely give the body the reverence it deserves, and its preparation would be the ultimate challenge to a chef. Valentino, who had known the answer, smiled a peculiar smile and retreated back into the darkness. Bannerman, seeing himself being forced to justify his position alone, pointed to the spoiled carcass of the rabbit. Don't be too all high and mighty, he said. Cannibal isn't so far away from us as you might think. Some of you might have noticed the leg on that rabbit. Why leave one leg on a rabbit, said the salesman. I wondered about that. I learned it in Malta a few years ago, replied Bannerman. He slipped a cigarette out of his silver case and stabbed his palm with it. The island is full of cats. You leave a single egg on any meat so that you can identify the beast. I mean, a rabbit is pretty similar to a cat. Very hard to tell them apart. I hope that wasn't a fucking cat, Bannerman, Laird Malcolm appeared to regain momentum after the meal. Only on your plate, replied Bannerman with a sidelong glass. Instead of questioning your free grub, why don't you do something useful and bring over another bottle of Lafroy? As Laird Malcolm returned, Bannerman pointed his lighted cigarette at the rabbit. I personally think it was medieval custom, perhaps even earlier than that. Of course, whispered one of their brothers. The Crusaders ate the Mohammedans on regular occasion. History is replete with examples, said Mulholland eagerly. Kalufu and the Kalingo are reputed to have practiced cannibalism, although everyone over the next hill was accused of cannibalism by their enemies, and most denied it. The eating of human flesh was probably far more prevalent than we imagine. New Guinea tribes, I recall, were reputed to be very fond of long pig. The closest flesh to man, said Bannerman with a grin. Thank feck it wasn't close to rabbits, said Laird Malcolm. Bannerman gave a knowing grin. It must have been around the phantom hour of two or three in the morning when a tawny owl began to sound in the darkness. The conversation had ranged the length of the world and back, and there was a kind of hushed expectancy gathering over the remaining guests. Barantino had long since left for Edinburgh. Bannerman was in a jolly mood, 
because he had secured his permission to fish the Great Burn in its environs, land owned by Farantino, for the last few years. The salesman's head hit the table, so we no longer had to suffer his gaucheries. The crofters were holding up, but Laird Malcolm appeared to have run off with a young English waitress. The accordionist was asleep, but the fiddler still toyed with the melody of farewell to whiskey in a thoughtful, self-immersed fashion. The company had settled into that period of the evening when great truths and greater banalities emerge. The rational mind has long since given up the ghost, and all conversations become a subliminal jigsaw of reaction and metaphor, gesture and symbolism. But the flick of a wrist, the twitch of a smile, the blink of an eye convey more than any words. One can nearly see the company's soul through the bleary, drunken eye. The whisky had given us breath, and now it took us into the low road, the Hades of the Scottish collective but conscious. A dark underworld inhabited by the ghosts, fairies, sprites, silkies and bogies of myth and legend. The fiddler would find a tune in that maze, and a hundred years from its finding, it would be part of the woven tapestry of living traditional music. The whisky tasters would find some description for the fragrance of a new cask. The laird would sense a new wonder in his lady. We were, in short, in the dream time. It was thus that I almost gave a start when MacDonald stood clumsily to his feet. For a second I thought that one of the occultists was working the man like a puppet. He pulled a small bottle of whisky unlabeled from his pocket and pushed two glasses into the centre of the table. Carefully he poured the entire contents of the small miniature into the glasses. He passed one to Campbell who looked at it with the absorption of the drunk. To Jeannie, he said. Campbell took the glass in hand and slowly stood to his feet. Jajini, he replied, and drained the glass. He sat down heavily, morose in his thoughts. MacDonald poured the remaining whisky on the floor. I hardly need explain that Scottish hospitality demands that if a bottle be open, it must be shared. One or two of the guests stared aghast towards Bannerman to see his reaction. I, I almost spoke. It would have been the first time that evening. But Mulholland gave me a nudge. A lot of people have been thrown out of the hotel for a lot, lot less. Bannerman stared at the two men with an enigmatic eye. It was a blatant affront to him as a host. He rose stiffly to his feet. I fully expected him to explode in a rage. Time for bed, he said quietly. We rose early. It was bitterly cold and my head was thumping with toxins. While Holland and I got kitted out in our fishing gear, with heavy waders and wax jackets provided by our host. When we stumbled outside like a red nail clipping along the ridge of Ben Craig, the glimmer of the dawning sun was visible from the hotel, but 200 feet below at the small wharf the mist made it invisible. In the shadow of the mountains, Spanaman had organised a party of three boats, himself, Laird Malcolm, his butler and Laird Mervaness, and the largest four-oared Norwegian boat. MacDonald and Campbell made the next party in a smaller white hall, while Holland and I settled for a tiny skiff that had seen better days. The express plan was to fish the western end of the loch near the peninsular waters of Craig Burn, where a short passage of roiling water overhung by cliffs led to the smaller enclosed waters of Lesser Loch Craig, and here emerged the tributary of the Lochy Burn. By the afternoon we would move to the smaller section of Loch Craig, and from there we would split again and try some fly fishing in the waters of Lochy Burn, with the gloaming hour the trout would be rising again. There was a kind of informal competition, but as with all fishermen, about the last consideration was catching a fish. Bannerman had stocked each boat with bacon butties and flasks of coffee and a bottle of ten-year-old Lefroy to keep us warm. There was a hamper with several iced beers, chicken legs, bread, pickles and cheeses under the seats. We cast off the wharf, a swift dram for luck, and the hangover and tiredness washed away. While Holland took the oars and I felt a strange, almost hallucinogenic exuberance. All morning we fished the main body of water in stoic silence. The tiny flies rose around us, the fish began to rise, sending concentric ripples across the gleaming water. Once or twice we saw a giant trout leap from the water like shining paladins. As the daylight progressed, I dozed off for a while, lulled by the lap of water on the gunwales. Slowly, with a certain inevitability, the three boats drew nearer to the buttresses of the cliffs. The sun, late over the mountains, tipped the peaks 
and ascended the heavens the colour of a blood orange. Cloud banks embroidered with violent red began to disperse in the light breeze. The air grew warmer. In the late afternoon, by some kind of mental osmosis, all the boats gathered together at the western end of the main lock, and we sculled towards the gap between the hills. From here the tremendous heights of the Craig Falls could be fully appreciated. Cliff walls were clearly visible through the buttress face like the shadow of a giantess viewed between a gap and enormous curtains. As the trains of a parted wedding dress revealed the thigh of the bride, the shining water spilled down the glistening rock walls. We debouched into the lesser lock, and the full grandeur of the enclosed space fell out before us. It had the air of a secret garden, mists burgeoning up in ever-moving clouds, the roar of the waterfalls, the thrumming air, dark pines marching down the northern slopes of Ben Craig, the vast skirt of the scree slope before it spilled into the waters. But most splendid of all, the huge and indomitable cliff face between and surrounding the two waterfalls, glistening with damp and emerald with lichen, its ancient granite surface formed by cataclysmic events lost in antiquity. The cragged overhangs, where so many climbers have tried and failed, its feet a scatter of huge boulders and immense broken rocks. We rounded away from the cliff and beached on an inlet opposing the Craig Falls, the Scotch pines rose up here on a sharp slope above a natural shale beach, for Bannerman had somehow carved a few wooden tables from dark wood. He had sent some waitresses and his junior chefs by the hidden paths, and already deer roasted under an open fire. The ladies, wrapped up in shawls, sat on camp chairs, drinking champagne. The mistress of Lord Mark Vernus was posing in partial disablement for one of the occultists, while the others spent an inordinate time partly gathering mushrooms from the forest floor. I couldn't quite participate in the reveries with any real enthusiasm, and after a space, Mulholland joined me as I contemplated the falls from the shale beach. You're wondering about last night, he said. Yes, the whiskey. I'm still amazed that Bannerman didn't throw MacDonald out of the building. Must have looked bad. I'd I better tell you the story. Mulholland drew out a Havana, cut and lit it. After a space, he said. It was thirty years ago. MacDonald was engaged to Jeannie Brown. But Campbell said that he was engaged to, to a Jeannie Brown. Yes, he was, but only after Jeannie broke off with MacDonald. Ah. It was a cause celebrate at the time. She had bridal nerves, or whatever they call it. Campbell was the best man. She ran off with him on the night of the wedding. And MacDonald calls the man his best friend? Holland laughed. Well, they certainly were the best of friends for a while. Well, Holland contemplated the burning end of the cigar. No, in fact, MacDonald tried to kill Campbell a few days later. It was all very unpleasant. He would have killed him, too, but uh, Jeannie stopped it in time. Jean was, well, she was an incredibly beautiful woman, fiery, red-haired, a magnificent woman, really. I'd have married her myself if she'd noticed me at all. Some admission. You never saw her dance, said Mulholland. His eyes drifted across visions of long ago. The cigar burned forgotten in his hand. Finally, he came back to me. Well, MacDonald left Scotland and became that sort of freebooter that men become when slighted in love. Took chances, risks, worked on the oil rigs in Norway, road building out east, gambled in Ireland. I think he was a mercenary soldier for a bit. Made a fortune and lost it several times over. There was obviously a reconciliation of some sort. I, I glanced back at the fire, where the two whiskey tasters were laughing and joking over a leg of the wild deer. Yes, but not how you might imagine it, though. But a year after the fiasco, Campbell made an announcement in the Times for his forthcoming wedding to Jeannie Brown, and by private invitation, a date for his stag night. As a bit of a joke, it was to be done in the tiny bothy up from that hotel at Glen Cole. Stag night in one of these pokey bothies. Must have been a bit of an enthusiast. Well, we're all very young and hardy. Boys from the rugby club, sportsmen, climbers, and... You can make these little mountain huts quite comfortable. A good fire, loads of whiskey. I, I recall we had a big bonfire outside too. And we directed some decent tents. Sounds almost tolerable. Almost, grinned Mulholland. It was late September for, before that hard winter. There had been a rush of early snow which persisted. And then over the months gave us the worst conditions in living memory. Campbell, being a great climber, had organised a week's climbing around Glen Cole. The wives and girlfriends were all staying at the hotel down the hill but the stag night was clearly going to be an all-male affair. It could have been a bit of a rum-do, because Jimmy MacDonald arrived in the early hours sporting a gun. 
and was quite obviously going to take the opportunity to murder his old friend. Jesus, remind me not to mess with the McDonald's. Not where the heart is concerned, Mulholland, with an ironic grin. What saved Campbell's life was something quite out of the ordinary. You see, the hen night was going on across the glen, in the lounge room of the hotel. I can visualise it now, even after all these years. It was faintly conceivable that the men could keep a covert eye on the girls, and vice versa. The hills make distance deceptive. You could actually call out and be heard down below. An adventurous soul could be down the mountains and out the back with a lady, or improvise a quick rendezvous outside somewhere. I was frankly in a bit of a quandary myself, because I was half thinking I might grab Jeannie and elope. She was really that beautiful, and I was young and not a little drunk. She'd been dancing all night to the local band. The recordist was at Bannerman's last night. Uh, I'd seen Jeannie at intervals through the evening, through the big windows of the hotel, and laughing with her friends and the local village lads outside in the snow. Some hours earlier, just before the men and women separated for the night, I'd even had a brief talk with her at the door of the hotel, where I nearly spilled my heart out. She seemed distant somehow, not just by my obvious difficulties. I don't think she even heard what I said. I think she may well have been having regrets about the whole marriage thing. It's hard to tell with a woman like that. She was flighty, over-enthusiastic, glowing a little with the drink. It's, it's difficult to remember after all these years. I do remember that she was dressed all in red, a beautiful silken shawl, ruby stilettos designed by that London fellow, and a scarlet Parisian evening dress that made her look like something out of epic theatre. Utterly stunning. While Helen drew on a cigarillo, when he spoke again, it was almost as though it was only to himself. I must have been the last to see her later that night. The moon was up, a clear, bright evening, with the whole splendour of the heavens looking down. The air was brisk and cool, with your breath condensing and your teeth on edge. I had been drifting in and out of the stag night. Campbell was consuming whiskey like water. Everyone was tremendously drunk and singing rugby songs, not particularly my cup of tea even then. I wandered out a little into the snow and looked down across the deep spaces of Glen Craig. It's there that I saw her walk out towards the hills, a lonely little red figure making tiny tracks like a robin through the drifts. To this day, I cursed myself for not following her. I didn't really know what was happening, what she was doing. How, how could I know? But she walked out into the snow, said Mulholland quietly, never came back. Barman shouted across in some unusual excitement. He wanted us all to come together for some sort of announcement. While Holland picked up a stone and threw it into the water. For a few seconds he watched the ripples battle with the flurry. Then he turned round and we both made our way to the fire. Just before we reached it he stopped and said, That's what the drink was about last night and why Bannerman said nothing. It's something they've been doing every year for the past twenty years in remembrance of Jeannie. Many people here know about it. Is Jeannie buried nearby, I said. No, said Mulholland. That was the reason that Campbell and MacDonald reconciled. Jean's body was never found. Campbell was in a state of shock. When the alarm was raised, MacDonald threw away his gun and took charge of the main search party. He was on the rescue team in his younger days. He spent three days awake in the mountains, leading groups through some of the worst conditions imaginable. The weather turned really bad, gale force, winds, whiteouts. Two men were killed in the rescue party. Campbell broke his leg in a fall, but MacDonald ploughed on without sleep for days, searching, searching. We all tried, of course, but MacDonald was driven. I'm no slouch, but I collapsed of exhaustion. Many of us did. The last one on the hill was MacDonald. They brought him down in a stretcher, and then the weather turned so bad the search was called off. Everyone expected Jean's body to turn up with the thaw, but she was never found. It was a terrible, terrible affair while Holland peered at the end of his cigar and spoke with a noticeable tremor. About ten years after, MacDonald told a few of us that he distilled a special whiskey in the members of Jeannie. He only ever shares it with Campbell. Come on, you two, shouted Bannerman. There's venison on the go and announcements to be made. It was a strange fact that despite a promising look to, to the water, the only one who had caught a fish all morning was MacDonald. He stood holding up on the scales with the vertices with an enormous grin on his florid face. Campbell was laughing at his friend's antics as he haphazardly gathered firewood from where he sat. The mistress of Fairness had wrapped up the shawl and now examined her unfinished portrait with a critical eye. 
The other occultist offered some mushrooms to Bannerman, but the big man gave him a dark look. Bannerman inspected his work. He had made a small pit and placed a young deer in it. After stuffing the chest cavity full with the heart, liver, vegetables, butter, salt, pepper, and various secrets of his trade, then he had wrapped it heavily in foil and placed it down in the fire pit on the hot coals. After all this effort, his boys had built a big fire on top of the deer. The flames of the fire were dying now, and Bannerman began to unwrap the carcass, exposing the single hind leg. The occultist was cleaning his paintbrushes. He looked at Bannerman with a keen expression. You knew that custom of identifying meat was a secret among initiated Highlanders. Bannerman shrugged. No one is making you eat it. The meat fell from the bones, revealing the ribcage as he drew out portions with an expert hand. In a few moments, we all found a seat on the camp chairs and tree stumps. The waitresses served us venison on china plates, while Bannerman poured out the whiskey. MacDonald had given his fish to a waitress to try on the grill. The carcass of the deer seemed to mesmerise him. He sat vacantly holding a whiskey glass for a moment, staring at Bannerman helplessly, and then he came to his senses. He stood up. I've something to say, he intoned heavily, as most of you know it's been thirty years since we lost Jeannie. Here's their memory. He took a sip from his glass and we joined him. Not long after she disappeared, I found a secret in an entirely illegal distillery somewhere in the vicinity. Since that time, I've allowed a bottle out every year, and on the anniversary of Ginny's disappearance, I've shared it with my friend and fellow raconteur, Mr. Campbell. Campbell nodded in acknowledgement and looked soberly towards the fire and the stripped carcass of the deer. People have badgered me for years about a drink of the whisky, but I've always reserved that for my friend. Those who know the story, he nodded to Bannerman, have respected my wishes. The location of the still is another matter entirely. A few heads looked up in wonder. MacDonald smiled. After thirty years, I've decided to reveal the location and allow everyone who wants it a bottle of the whisky. My, my, said Mahone, that's a very gracious offer. Not quite as gracious as you might imagine, replied MacDonald with a wry grin. There is a single condition. Those who want to see the distillery must climb the Kriak Falls with me tomorrow morning. There was an astonished silence. The report of the cracking wood in the fire seemed to pierce the ubiquitous deluge of the falls. A moorhen whirred up from the surface of the lock was served by some invisible predator. Campbell was the first to speak. Just give it another go, I said quietly. My God, said Lord MacDonald, you nearly died in that climb thirty years ago. But I didn't, said Campbell, with a twinkle in his eye. I have a hundred percent record in the fall, said Mahong with a grin, having done it once thirty years ago and not fallen off. I'll have another go. I'll have a crack at it, I said, and I suddenly regretted it. Bannerman shook his head. Bloody mad, he said, the lot of you. Then he grinned. Let's drink to bloody mad people. If I had any regrets about my decision that evening, they were magnified a million times in the morning when I stared up from the boulder-strewn feet of the creek falls. While Hollander tried to talk me out of it in the evening, but had finally agreed to act as my lead, MacDonald was going to share the ascent with Campbell. The three experienced climbers were dishing out the gear, chalk bags, cremantel ropes, hexes, carbines and the like. Every now and then MacDonald would laugh. You didn't have all this crap when we first took this wee climb, he said to Campbell. No, but as I recall, Jeannie and the girls were watching us at the time when we both decided to be ridiculously foolhardy. Not even a rope, said Mahone to me. But then we're all in our twenties then. I'd have to settle for a circus safety net at the moment. After a few minutes, they had organised the ropes. This chalk might be handy, though, against the damp from the falls, said Campbell, reflectively. No doubt, said MacDonald. Everyone set? I started this foolish affair, so I suppose I'd better be first up. Without another word, MacDonald began the ascent. Campbell waited a few moments and followed him on the rope. There are moments when one reflects on decisions, and one of the moments occurs when you stand at the bottom of a sheer cliff. I watched MacDonald move up the face with that peculiar undulating grace that marks the born mountaineer. He was a colossal man, but on the mountains he looked like a ballet dancer. Campbell, thinner, more fragile, but no less a climber, followed like a spider on a web. They both took a route slightly to the right of the cascading fountains and cataracts of the Sister Falls. I looked away from the cliff face to the scree slopes, the scotch pines and the splendid waters of the loch. The dawn would break over the mountain tops in a few moments. 
It was late September and the winter would be coming on. We were quite alone. Well, Holland gave me a sharp look. Still time to call it off. We're experts, even if we're no longer spring chickens. There's no shame in it. It's a risky climb. I shook my head. Sometimes death seems if not welcome, not an enemy. While Holland shrugged, checked his rope and began the ascent. While Holland had told me that he was a better climber for having only one eye, he always insisted that the single eye kept him more focused than other climbers, and gave a kind of two-dimensional security to his climbing, as though it were all some old-fashioned video game. While Holland, like the others, was certainly a natural climber, he lacked the grace of MacDonald and was slightly heavier than Campbell. There was no doubting the aggressive strength in his hands. Perhaps because of the risk, Mulholland elected to take a separate approach some three or four metres right from the drop of the others. I noticed as I began to scale the surface that Mulholland was leaving a wider gap between his belaying ropes and MacDonald. His strong hands spanned out like starfish on the green-scale moss. His legs taut and the moleskin breeches hugged the cliff as his booted feet found slender purchase on the basalt. After some moments... He fixed a static belay, and I followed, mimicking his movements as far as I could. <coughs> I had once in my youth attempted the Medusa Wall in the Lake District, but had been forced down by a turn in the weather. These Craig Falls were far more intimidating. The roar of the water that cascaded in leaping cataracts, the damp and lichened surface of the rocks, the constant spray, the paucity of holes and crevices, the treachery of the rock, the very steepness of the climb. I could never have been first on the rope, and even second became an endless nightmare, while Holland kept a constant running commentary as he advised a weak and stone, crumbling rock, special grips and holes that he had rehearsed with me in the wee hours the night before. Minutes seemed like hours. My hands and legs were cramped with pain. Once, and only once, I glanced downwards. The sudden shock of that immense fall sent vertigo to spin in my brain. For moments I clutched at the cliff face, frozen. Look up, said Mulholland tersely. Look up. I pulled my face upwards. Mulholland gave me a grin. He belayed again. Safe as houses now. We've done half in. There's the lights just up here where we can rest. I could see the feet of Campbell and MacDonald dangling above the abyss. A few minutes later, and we joined them on the ledge. By unspoken agreement, they allowed me to rest in the single deep cleft that traversed the ledge. I'm not embarrassed to admit that after a single glance across the unfolding spaces of the air, I shut my eyes for the length of that stay. I could hear MacDonald and Campbell in voices raised above the dives of the waterfall and the flint flickering breeze. I kept this cavern in secret since I stumbled over it thirty years ago, said MacDonald. Just up there beside the bladder fern, do you see it? Where the water leaps off that stone shaped like a face, it's behind there. Under the waterfall? Yes, said MacDonald. A man could stand squarely in it. I think the reason it was never discovered is that you have to climb under the hoverang. Extremely difficult under the waterfall. It's completely massive on the other side, but you can just about do it from here. You old dog, said Campbell affectionately. After all these years, how the hell did you get us still in there? I've got a whole lot more in me than you would imagine. There's an easier route from the west. I, I, I lowered the stuff at the top on ropes and, and abseiled at night. After a while, it was a piece of cake. Piece of cake, my ass, said Campbell. I'll take the first look if you don't mind. Not at all, said MacDonald. You've waited long enough. A few seconds later, I opened my eyes. It was one of these moments that you might see in a film, but you would never believe it possible. Mulholland was checking his belaying rope. MacDonald was just beyond him on the edge, and Campbell was about the height and length of a man in a diagonal from the party. He was bent in a crouch like an overturned beetle, head masked by the crashing water beneath the overhang as he performed a classic three-point move. And then he slipped. To this day... I think it impossible. The belaying rope snapped on the rope, and MacDonald lunged suddenly forward, and with one immensely powerful arm clutching the rock, caught Campbell by the leg as he fell. I can picture it now, after all these years, Campbell's hoarse cry as he fell, his head striking the basalt as he tipped over upside down, while Holland turning aghast, and the giant MacDonald grasping outwards to clutch into space, somehow beyond any sensible physics, MacDonald took the falling body in one hand and clung like a maniac to a crevice. Horrifically, for us all, while Holland, in the same in moment, was hit on the shoulder by the loosened climbing anchor, he was already turning and the weight of it took him off the ledge. Fortunately, his anchor held. I was stuck still in the cleft but could see that Mulholland, although unable to help immediately, was not about to fall. MacDonald shouted for assistance but could not see us. 
Instead, like some gargantuan, he drew Campbell up and managed somehow to make a fireman's lift. The thinner man had been struck but had not lost consciousness. He clung on a step by a grueling step. MacDonald unroped and prey at any moment to certain death pressed upwards to the overhang. There was moments of sheer vicarious terror as he paused at the cascade of water, seemed to lose his grip, then plunged through the torrent and was gone. While Holland had got to his feet, he looked down, and I realised that he had seen nothing of the impossible climb, and thought they had both fallen. Up, I said through gritted teeth. He went up. With Campbell? With Campbell on his back? My God, said Mulholland. My good God. In the next few moments, Mulholland and I made up the ledge, and under the overhang, where the cool, sharp waters thrashed at us like birches. I stumbled forward, my head still spun with the selfish reflection that I had nearly been left alone on the cliff with its hellish, vertiginous species, and suddenly we were all inside, soaked and exhilarated in the comforting darkness of a hidden cave. MacDonald had lit a couple of paraffin lamps. The constantly shifting curtain of the waterfall played on the interior of the cave, like one of these magic lantern slides, a kaleidoscopic tapestry made eerie by the subdued, partially shuttered lights. In the background, I could see through dim shadows huge, towering bell-like shapes, barrels, copper boilers and tubs. In the foreground, a rusty Bain Marie had a, and a stake dust-clad beaker stood before rows of glass bottles. On the left, in a recess, a large chicken cage, beside that a bunk, two chairs and a small table with inlaid drawers covered in old tools of varying sorts. Sitting on a blanket right before us, Campbell clutched his bruised head with one hand as MacDonald administered the last drops of whisky from a flask. Campbell shook his head after a few gulps. I thought that was me, he said quietly. Never seen anything like it, I said under my breath. Nothing short of a miracle. My friend, said Campbell thickly, suddenly gripping MacDonald's arm. Who's like you? Not many, said MacDonald with a grin. He rubbed his shoulder. You're heavier than I reckoned. Sorry. Don't worry, said MacDonald right to his feet. I'm sure this will be worth all the excitement. I saw now that there was a recess a little to the right, festooned with woven refurbishing and blankets, and what appears to be a plain woven canvas drape across the upper part of a large barrel, while Holland and I walked away forward. How on earth did you do all this, said MacDonald. It was my all-consuming passion, replied MacDonald, his face wreathed in an absurd smile. It was all for the whisky. The whisky bar. That's the thing about whisky. It's the water of life. It's deeper than anything else we have. It provokes a mythic response for the deep places of the body and mind. It's greater than us all. He drew two glasses from a drawer and filled them from the exposed spigot of the huge whisky barrel. You don't mind, do you? he said to Mulholland. This is between MacDonald and me. While well, Holland shook his head. MacDonald walked back with the glasses to his friend. He stood framed in the curtain of falling water like two gentlemen toasting in a chiaroscuro pitcher. I have waited thirty years for this, said Campbell with a rueful smile. Schlangeva. He drew a long dram from the glass, his face screwing up at the bitter taste. MacDonald smiled. And I waited longer for this. He flicked on a hidden switch. There was a peculiar sound like a small generator. A light shone behind the barrel. The canvas that covered the upper half of the old whiskey barrel suddenly revealed itself as a theatre scrim, or gauze, which, when lit from the back, exposed its hidden tableau. From the top of the barrel, a solitary human leg could now be discerned, extruding from the centre of the cask, in its way much like one of the exposed legs of the Wicked Witch and the Wizard of Oz, viewed not with an adult perspective, but with the transfixed eyes of a terrified child. Rotted flesh, saponified in the red silk stockings, seemed to slowly ripple and move in the shimmering, deceptive light. On the slender foot, the exposed yellow bone spread like an ivory fan, encased in a ruby-red stiletto that shone with a macabre museum glow. It was as though the woman who had worn the shoe over thirty years before might suddenly ask her lover if it suited her. At the same moment, I observed with a sickening lunge with the long red hair clung to the lip of Campbell's glass. He looked back with an expression of bewilderment, which I will never forget, to the shocking extradition from the barrel, 
and all that it implied. Somehow he tore his eyes from the sight of the mummified leg, the stockings, the stiletto, only to stare appalled at the familiar red hair curling wet from the lip of his whiskey glass. Oh, she excellente, said MacDonald. You're very, very good health. He licked his lips with a mocking smile and took a single sip from his glass. For a few moments he rolled the slug of whiskey in his mouth, saving the aromatics with all the elan of an experienced taster, then staring mercilessly at Campbell with an expression of gloating lust and grinning the grin of an exultant feed. MacDonald walked deliberately backwards through the curtain of water. On the following evening, Mulholland and I got back to Bannerman's Hotel. After long interviews and the inevitable red tape at the local police station, the tragic death of the two whiskey tasters was already local gossip. Climbing accidents were not so common that the policemen who accompanied us didn't need a whiskey. The dark humour of the Highlands forced the older officer to express his opinion, that the worst of it was that MacDonald hadn't mentioned the location of his illicit still before his tragic fall. Mulholland agreed, but for once declined Bannerman's Lefroy in favour of a tepid glass of water. <laughs>